I want you to think of a time in your life when your expectations came face to face with the realities of life. And for most of us, that has been something we've experienced multiple times throughout our life. Myself, I'm a, I'm a millennial, and it feels like one of the defining characteristics of my generation is this expectation of life that we had coming into conflict with the realities of life. See, for a lot of uh, people in my generation, what they feel like is that they were sold an expectation that they were to work hard in high school, and then they would get to go to a four-year university, and they could get a degree in whatever they wanted. It didn't matter. And then once they completed that, they would get to go to their dream job. They'd ask to speak to the manager. They'd look them in the eye, give them a firm handshake, and they'd get whatever job they asked for. And then they would start that job, and they'd stay there working that job for 30 or 40 years. And this would allow them now to get married and have like two and a half kids have a three-bedroom, two-bath house in the suburbs with a white picket fence and a dog in the backyard, maybe a boat and an RV or both, and they get to go on some big vacation every couple of years, and they would do this until they reached the age of retirement, all while their spouse stayed at home, and they'd ride off into the sunset with a pension and social security provide the rest of their life. And of course, what my generation has found is that expectation really has not lived up to the reality of the life. And for when any time that happens for us, our expectation meets reality, we're left with really two choices. The first one is we can see the reality and adjust. Leave behind our expectation and adjust to the, the reality that's in front of us. Or the other option, which is to, to live out this famous quote that I've heard that apparently comes from an episode of Doctor Who, that is, I reject your reality and substitute it with my own reality. And if you've ever seen somebody do that, you probably know how well that works out for them. And today what we're going to be looking at, amongst other things, is the disciples' expectation of who Jesus is and what he will do and how that comes into conflict with the reality that Jesus is going to reveal to them. Uh, today we're continuing our series looking at the Gospel of Mark. We're kind of at the halfway point. We'll be in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. So if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, Mark 8, 22. And before we get started, just a, a quick refresh about last week, because this chapter, there's a theme that runs all the way through it uh, that's going to that's gonna shape our understanding today. And so last week, Pastor Ed covered the first half of Mark 8. There covers this confrontation Jesus has with the Pharisees. That, and what we see is their spiritual blindness. And they're blind for many reasons. One of them is just this hardening of their heart towards Jesus. And in this conversation, they ask for a, a sign from Jesus, as if though all the signs and miracles that he performed isn't enough. And Jesus looks at them and says, you'll get no sign from me. And then he has this interaction with his disciples. Again, we see spiritual blindness. That he, he th warns them of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they hear Jesus say this, and they look to each other, and they're like, is this because we forgot the bread? And Jesus is like, what are you talking about bread for? Again, this spiritual blindness, and today we're going to see this spiritual blindness be unveiled, and Jesus reveals the truth to them. And so it starts off, though, with another story, another story of Jesus' healings. Verse 22 says, and they came to Bethsaida. Now, Jesus and the disciples, they were going back and forth across the Sea of Galilee, and they're once again back on the east side amongst the Gentiles. And it says, And some people brought to him, that's Jesus, a blind man, and begged him to touch him. The understanding here is they're bringing this man, and they want him to touch him, because the belief is simply if Jesus touches this man, he'll heal him. And it says, Jesus, he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the village. Again, we see this compassion. We see this personal touch of Jesus. He sees this man who is experiencing blindness, and we don't know if this is a genetic defect or something, uh, some trauma that he's experienced in his life. But what Jesus does is he once again removes him from the crowd, removes him from the spectacle, and gives him his personal undivided attention. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? So Jesus is now going to perform his miracle. He spits on his eyes. He touches his eyes. And he asks them this question. And it says, verse 24, And he, the man, looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. So this miracle, this healing that Jesus performed, what we see is it's, it's not sufficient. The man looks around, and everything's still really blurry. He sees people, but they look like trees. Maybe it's silhouettes. We don't know. But whatever has gone on, Jesus' healing isn't enough to fully heal the man. Verse 25 says, Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, 
And he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Jesus performs the healing for the second time in a row, and this man is finally, his sight is restored, and Jesus sends him back home. He warns him, don't go to Bethsaida. Keep, again, this messianic secret that he's holding up. And this, interest, this, this story of healing is really interesting because it's unlike any other story we see. Jesus in it, right, his miracle the first time seems to be insufficient. Jesus lays his hand on him after spitting on him, and he heals him, but only partially. And when, when something like this happens with Jesus that really de- defies our expectations of him, it should give us pause. It should question, ask us, or que- we should question why. Why is Jesus unable to heal this man the first time? And the, perp- the reason for this is this healing, this miracle, unlike his other miracles, contains a deeper meaning behind it. His other miracles are right, they reveal his passion, they kind of reveal his personal touch, they reveal his nature, that he is God. But this miracle takes two miracles in one. And it's not because Jesus doesn't have the power to heal this man. Jesus has the power to do whatever he wants. We see him constantly heal people of their illnesses, of their diseases. He brings a girl back from the dead. He walks on water. He drives out spirits. He calms the storm. This man's blindness isn't in opposition to him. This isn't what finally defeats Jesus. He does this for a very specific purpose. See, this miracle actually is a lesson in and of itself. Jesus is kind of performing what we would call in children's ministry an object lesson. He's performing an action to illustrate a greater principle. And the principle is this, that sanctification is gradual. Now, sanctification is just this really fancy church word that is basically the process by which we are made holy. The process by which we become uh, the, the image of Christ, where we become really what he has already declared us to be in him, which is the righteous. And this process is a long, long, long process that takes a lifetime and beyond. See, Jesus is highlighting that sanctification doesn't work really on the timeline of man instead of the timeline of God. Because what we want in sanctification, we want the immediate, immediate response. We want to be holy like he is holy as soon as we put our faith in him, but that's not how it works. And Jesus is really focusing in on up to this point, the first part of sanctification. Sanctification starts with our belief in Christ. And he's really honing in on this spiritual blindness that we've seen through the first eight chapters. That people are all questioning who's Jesus, who is Jesus. The Pharisees are questioning who is he. The disciples are questioning who he truly is. And Jesus is saying it's not It's not like an accident that everybody's struggling with who he is. This is by design. And this carries over throughout the entire sanctification process. We become more like him over this long, slow process. And it's a good reminder for us, both as disciples of Christ, but also as we disciple other people, that this is how it actually works. How many of us have been stuck, if we're followers of Christ, been at a time in our life where we're just struggling? We desire to live more like him. We desire to experience the fruit of the Spirit. We desire to overcome some particular sin in our life. And we're stuck just going day after day. It's not happening. Because when we're in the middle of it, it just seems like nothing's changing. But when we take this step back, we look back over years, decades, we can see how Jesus has transformed us. I look back over the past 20 plus years of how Jesus has been maturing me, has been transforming me to look more like him. And right, for day to day, I don't see it, but over the decades, I can see how he has made me to live and be more like him. And as we disciple the people around us, our friends, the people at church or at work, or even our kids, it's a good reminder that this is how it works. How many of us have been trying to share the gospel with people and it feels like, man, you've got everything you need. You understand who Jesus is. You even desire Jesus. You just won't take that step of faith. This is often a gradual process. The people we're supporting in the walk with Jesus as they're going through whatever it may be, addiction or sin or anything. And we're just like, they're just struggling. This is a long process. Sanctification is a long process that doesn't go at the speed we desire. Instead, it goes at the speed that God has set out for each and every one of us. And so we want to keep this whole idea of sanctification is gradual in mind because it's going to paint the rest of this chapter. It's going to paint actually the rest of the gospel. 
<coughs> From here it says, Jesus went on with his disciples to the village is of Chesarai Philippi. Now from here, they've gone from Bethsaida. They're going just straight due north. They're in, still in Gentile territory. And on the way, it says, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Verse 28 says, and they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. If you've been following along in this series, this is not the first time you've heard this being said. Right, this is the common uh, response of particularly the Jewish people to who actually Jesus is. There's three main beliefs. The first one is, is John the Baptist come back to life, uh, performing all these miracles, but ultimately possibly seeking out revenge. He's going to come for King Herod, the man who's put him to death. The other one of the beliefs is that he's Elijah, that he is the second coming of Elijah, and this would have been significant to the Jewish people. This would have been according to prophecy that Elijah was supposed to come to usher in, to pave the way for the Messiah. And what we know now, looking back, is it was actually John the Baptist come in the spirit of Elijah to call this gospel of repentance for the arrival of Jesus. And then the third made response is that he's just another prophet. This would have been significant. The line of prophets have stopped, and this would have been a reinstitution of the prophets by God, a major moment in uh, Judaism. So we see these three responses. And then Jesus, though, he's going to ask them a follow-up question. And this question, this is the question. This is the most important question. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to, know, to tell no one about him. Jesus really gets down to the question that we all have to answer. Who do you say that he is? And what Peter says, and his answer isn't just representing his belief, the idea is that it's representing all of, or at least most of, the disciples that are present. And he says, you are the Christ. This is a word that we often use, right, in reference to Jesus. Often we just said Jesus Christ, but Christ isn't a name. Christ is a title. The word in Greek is actually Christos. It means the anointed one. It's meant to be synonymous with the Messiah. For the first time we see in Jesus' ministry, at least among the Jewish people, someone has correctly identified who Jesus is. We see in this moment the, what all of these eight chapters of the gospel have been building up. This is the climactic moment of the first half of Mark's gospel. The disciples finally recognize who Jesus actually is. He is not just a prophet. He's not just a wise rabbi. He's not some really good guy. He is, in fact, Jesus the Messiah, the one they have been waiting for for generations, the one that was promised by God after man's fall in the garden. This is finally it. And they've, they've correctly identified him. <clears throat> but this question, again, this question is the question. See, what Jesus desires is, <laughs> and what we're all going to have to do at some point, is answer this question because it's going to decide not just a, a question, but this question decides our entire eternity. It shapes what we truly believe about Jesus, and what Jesus wants is our belief. Jesus wants our belief in who he actually is. Each and every person here, each and every person through all of history has to answer this question. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he just some random guy? Is he some really important historical figure who had some really good teachings? Is he some made-up fictional belief? Or is he really who he says he is, the Messiah, God in the flesh, the one who has come to redeem us? And I love how he answers, ask, excuse me, asks this question, because he asks it in two steps. He asks them first, who do people say I am? An important question, but then he gets down to the, to the actual question that matters. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Because <clears throat> ultimately for each and every one of us, what other people believe about Jesus, at least for us personally, is inconsequential. Like, I care about what other people think. I want everybody else to believe this. And, and what other people have believed has shaped my faith. But ultimately what they believe is inconsequential to my personal belief. Jesus wants our personal belief in him. If you've ever been in student ministry, children's ministry, like you've seen this play out. A great kid who comes, and it's time in your class, 
well-behaved, knows all about the Bible, maybe even shows that they are followers of Christ. But what ends up happening, they leave the church and their faith leaves with them. Or they, I should say is left behind. Because their faith wasn't their faith, it wasn't their belief, it was often their, their parents' belief or their pastor's belief or their friend's belief. It's not important what the people around us believe. What ultimately matters is what you know, us as individuals, what do we believe? This is the million dollar question. And so Jesus, though, he's going he's gonna to run with this, right? The disciples have finally answered the question correctly. Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And then he's going to go and he's going to explain to them what that actually means. Verse 31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, the Son of Man, again, just a messianic title, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Jesus just sits down with his disciples and he lays it out. Right? You've called me the Messiah. Here's what this actually looks like. And it says right at the end, he said this plainly. Jesus often is speaking in parables, like these, these veiled ideas, but for this time, he just tells them exactly what it's going to mean. He says, all right, Jesus, he tells them he's going to go ahead, he's going to suffer. The people who have been awaiting him, the, the leaders of the Jewish faith, they're going to reject him. He's going to die, but he's going to rise again. And it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine the audacity of Peter in this moment? He just correctly identified Jesus, and Jesus says, all right, here's what that's actually going to mean. And, G- and then Peter says, actually, Jesus, that's wrong. <laughs> and, it, and it's really easy for us to look now back at Peter and say, you fool, like, how could you possibly question Jesus? How could you question God? But what's really easy to miss is, in this moment, Peter's, the disciples, all of their expectations of the Messiah just got shattered against the reality of what Jesus laid out. This was not at all what they were expecting about Jesus. Their expectation, and not just their expectation, all of Israel's expectation for generations was that the Messiah was going to look very different than this. And we have overwhelming evidence of what that actually looked like. There's a couple of uh, documents from the time uh, that I wanted to share. The first one comes from what's called the Psalms of Solomon. And this, uh, this was a collection of writings. They're extra biblical. This is not the inspired word of God. This was just a, a collection of writings uh, from people in uh, Israel writing about what they believed about God. And they attributed the name of Solomon, although Solomon had nothing to do with it. And it says, Behold, O Lord, and raise up for them their king, the son of David, and gird him with strength, that he might shatter unrighteous rulers, and that may he may purge Jerusalem from nations that trample her down to destruction. He shall have the heathen nations to serve him under his yoke. There's another one written actually 30 years after Jesus died. Again, representing what the Jewish people believed about the Messiah. It's called the Palestinian Targum. Again, not scripture. This is to be taken as a commentary instead on scripture. It says, How beautiful is the king, the Messiah, who will arise from those who are of the house of Judah. He girds up his loins and goes forth and orders the battle array against his enemies and slays the kings along with their overlords. And no king or overlord can stand before him. He reddens the mountains with the blood of their slain. His clothing is dripped in blood like a wine press. This was their picture of the Messiah. Not a suffering servant, but a conquering warrior king who would come forth, who would purge the nations of unbelievers, who would conquer the unconquerable nation of Rome and finally establish Israel in his rightful place atop all of the other nations. That was the expectation, that was their desire, and here comes Jesus, and he just shatters all of that. He says, right, your expectations and your desires are not going to meet reality. And then he just lays out the gospel for him. That's what he does. He says, here's what the Messiah is actually going to do. He's going to come, he's going to live a perfect life, right? He's going to be condemned by the very people he has come to save, right? He's going to be mocked and tortured, he's going to be put up on a cross, and then he's going to die on that cross. But three days later, he's going to come back. 
And in that moment, right, he's not going to do this to meet your expectations or your desires. He's going to do this to meet and conquer the greatest need that you have, which is sin. That's what he came for. That's all of what he's done. He goes to the cross. He defeats sin and death by coming back to life so that you and I, the wrath of God is appeased, that we can have salvation. He dies for our sins so that you and I, we can have eternal life. And he lays that out for all of the disciples. And Peter says, no. No, what about what I had planned? What about my desires for you to be this warrior king? Verse 33 goes on. It, it says, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And Jesus has some harsh words for Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. The idea isn't Peter is actually Satan or that he's possessed by Satan, but instead that his ideas, his words that he says to Jesus are satanic in nature. This very much calls back to Jesus' time being tempted in the desert. Satan comes to him and says, you can have everything in the world. You can rule all the world simply by bowing down to me. And Jesus rejects him. He says, be gone, Satan. And he points to this idea that it's not to be done in man's way or according to man's desires, but according to the will of God. And this was Jesus living that out and saying, Peter, your mind, like Satan, is focused on taking the easy path, the path that appeases you. That's not what I came for. He's going to continue on, though. He's going to continue now teaching what it actually is that he has come for. It says, in calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but forever loses his life for my sake, and the gospels will save it. He just, he just, again, he's crushing expectations, right? Crushing the expectation of humanity that somehow we have the power, we have the ability to save ourselves. And Jesus says, you trying to save yourself, all that's going to mean for you, for your eternal life, is that you're going to lose it. The only way that you can save yourself, the, the only way that you can have eternal life is to turn to Christ. As he would say in his life, that he is the way, the truth, and life. He is the only answer, the only way to eternal life. He goes on, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? He asks two rhetorical questions with the implied answer of nothing. There's absolutely nothing you can give for your soul. There's no way you can save yourself. There's nothing worth abandoning your soul. Verse 38, he says, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And I love the way John Piper just describes this, right? That Jesus just is contrasting. If you're ashamed of him when he comes, right, he will in essence be ashamed of you. And Piper describes this as, what's the opposite of ashamed? It's pride. The question for us comes down to, are you ashamed of Christ or are you proud of him? Right? And do you live a life that actually reveals that? And not ashamed or proud like in, in a simple moment where you maybe fail to live out his standards or reject him in front of other people, but does your, the, the wholeness of your life, the way you live, reveal that you are ashamed to be associated with him or is he the prized possession of your life? Because what Jesus says is that someday, in response to that, he will either be ashamed of you or he will be proud of you. In all of this, what he's getting to, though, is he's defining what it is to actually believe that he is the Messiah. Because in his mind, right, believing immediately is to lead to following. That your belief in who he is should shape how you live your life. And he has this incredibly powerful statement back in verse 34. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That to call him the Messiah is supposed to immediately lead to us living in this manner. Not perfectly. Again, we're keeping in mind that sanctification is gradual. This is a lifetime movement empowered by the Holy Spirit. But this should be the direction of our life, to deny oneself. This is reflected in this idea of dying to oneself. 
Not denying yourself simply like the pleasures of the world. This isn't asceticism where we're denying the fun things or the pleasurable things simply for the sake of denial. In fact, I would say that's not even according to God's way. He created the world for us to enjoy. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the good things of life in their proper order and place and time. Instead, this is something deeper. He's saying, deny yourself as your own master. Deny yourself as the center of your life, the most prized thing in your world. Deny yourself as the center of the universe, because you're not. Jesus is. Deny yourself so that you can instead turn to him. And he goes on and says, you are to take up your cross and follow him. Now for us, we have the full picture of the cross where Jesus goes on the cross. This leans to go to one's death at some level. Again, but that's not the fullness of it. It's not just being willing to take our faith to the point that we would die for it. Although there is truth in that. And for many people over history, followers of Christ, that was the reality for them. Their faith led them to their death. But he's talking about a very specific part of the cross. This take up your cross. And for the disciples at the time, in the midst of the Roman Empire, this would have been a vivid picture. See, the, the, the idea of the cross as <clears throat> a form of execution was one of, like, as far as torture goes, as far as execution goes, it was a masterpiece, right? It was as cruel and unimaginable as you could picture. It may not be, like, the big, uh, uh, like, showy form of execution, but it got its point across very well. The Romans had perfected this execution in the cross, because yes, it was going up on a cross, and this was just a moment where you would be up there for hours or days, and in essence, you would kind of have to, you would, you would kill yourself. You would hang there and force yourself, you would have to pull yourself up to breathe, and you would stay alive as long as you could continue doing that. But when you gave up, that was the end of your life. And you would do this while everybody is watching. It was a spectacle. You were doing this in, amongst the elements, whether that was the hot summer sun or the cold winter night. You were doing this. This was miserable. This was torture until you died. But before that, there was a psychological aspect as well. See, after you were condemned to your death on a cross, they would hand you your cross and tell you to march to where you were to die. That's what we see of Jesus, right? The last couple of his last days. And in this moment, what you would do, you would take your cross, you would literally take the implement of your death, and you would carry it to the spot where you would die. This was just this moment where Rome would forcibly make you submit to their rule. You would be forced to submit to the, to the government, to the rulers that you once rebelled against. So it wasn't just going to the death, it was about submission to who you rebelled against. And that's what Jesus calls us to. Not forcibly, but willingly submit to the one that you once rebelled. The, the Bible says that we were at one time enemies of God. And so part of following him is willfully submitting to him. Deny yourself, turn to Jesus, and willfully submit. Jesus says this is what believing is. Believing isn't just intellectually acknowledging who he is, but then living a lifestyle that plays this out. There's one last part uh, to his interaction with the disciples, this particular interaction. It actually takes place in the next chapter, uh, but it is a continuation of this discourse. It says, verse 1, And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. This last verse is one of the more uh, debated verses, at least in the Gospel of Mark, really because it's just confusing what exactly is Jesus referring to. And it's confusing because there's no actual, like, very clear answer. There's a, a lot of different interpretations of them, some of them just far out wacky that cause a lot of big theological issues. Uh, but there's also some that really uh, don't really create any issues. There's two that we as a teaching team wanted to share, and they really come down to this. What does he mean when he says there are some standing here who will not taste death? And what does it mean when he says the kingdom of God after it's come with power? What is this event that he's referring to? And there's really two main interpretations that I think hold uh, <coughs> a good amount of validity that don't cause any theological problems that actually, if you play them out to the end, both uh, remain true to what Jesus has taught. The first one is this. When he says, who will not taste death, it's not to be taken literally except it's, it's figuratively. It's actually referring back to what he just said. 
when he's talking about deny yourself, die to yourself, and he's saying some of the disciples listening in that moment, you won't really fully believe until this event takes place. And then the event that goes along with this often is what will happen immediately following in next week's uh, verses passage. And that's this event called the transfiguration. They believe that is the kingdom of God has come in its power. That's the event he's referring to. And then the other interpretation uh, that he's saying this literally, that he's looking around at the disciples. Some of you literally will not die until after this event. And the idea behind this probably is he's referring to Judas, who dies before Jesus' event, which is the death and resurrection. Those are the two main interpretations. Uh, ultimately, <coughs> if you want to know more about this, you can go home, do your own study, look at it. There's a lot of people with a lot of ideas of what this means. And we share all that uh, and want to end with this reminder that for some of us, this is really interesting stuff, uh, and we, but we can get really bogged down in it and miss, and miss the significance of what Jesus was trying to get at. That he has, he has called us to believe in him as our Messiah, as our Savior, and in that has called us to follow him, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him. I'm going to go ahead and release the campus pastors. Love you guys. See you later.